So, okay. Um, uh, can you hear me? Good. So we're very happy to have for our final talk of the day, uh, Hiroshi Oguri, who will tell us about symmetry in quantum field theory and gravity. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'm particularly happy to be able to give this talk here because uh, uh, this is a work based on uh, my collaboration with Daniel Haro, uh, which started three years ago, almost three years ago, plus some months, uh, when I was spending a sabbatical here, uh, uh, 2015, I guess. And uh, so, so this appeared uh, uh, in this uh, large paper, and then we have uh, 1 to 35 compression ratio for this uh, shortened version, and uh, we collaborated in various different places, uh, Asia, Europe, and uh, uh, California. And so so the, uh, the, uh, the, the, this is a plan of my talk, so I will first uh, define what we mean by a global symmetry in quantum field theory. This is something that uh, we all know, but I would like to sort of uh, uh, discuss various technical detail of uh, uh, when we did, uh, that appear when we are dealing with symmetry in quantum field theory. And then uh, we, I would like to, I'm going to go on to define what we mean by global symmetry in quantum gravity. And the purpose of doing all of this is to actually show that in the context of ads cft correspondence, uh, there is no such thing about as uh, global symmetry in quantum gravity in ADS. So the task here is particularly difficult because uh, I, uh, we are, I'm going to immediately show that uh, such a thing doesn't exist. So we have to define something which does not exist. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, I will also discuss some uh, related uh, uh, issues that uh, uh, are sort of conditions uh, uh, on uh, symmetries and its realization in the context of uh, uh, quantum gravity. So, uh, let me uh, go straight on to some uh, technical aspect of uh, symmetry in quantum field theory. So uh, first, uh, in, in order so that uh, we all understand what we are talking about, uh, let me discuss uh, uh, what we mean by global symmetry in quantum field theory. So suppose we have quantum field theory uh, on some, uh, any dimension, and then this is a Cauchy surface and this is time. And we say that uh, this quantum field theory has global symmetry with group G if uh, these conditions are met. And first of all, uh, we require that uh, uh, for this given sigma, you have a Hilbert space. And then uh, there is a map, uh, actually a homomorphism, from the group to a set of unitary operator on this Hilbert space. <coughs> uh, I, we did not want to say this as representation of G because uh, uh, we would like to actually discuss this in the context when symmetry is spontaneously broken too. And in that case, uh, uh, we realized later, it turns out that uh, this map is not necessarily continuous. So uh, uh, we are relaxing this assumption and we're just requiring that this is actually a, a unitary uh, a homomorphism. And the other condition is that uh, uh, this symmetry is realized uh, on the space of, uh, uh, the, on the algebra of operator localized in S. And uh, so this, when we say that this is the algebra of operator, it, uh, I'm including things like Wilson loops when uh, the entire loop is included uh, in this region. So this is a statement that uh, uh, this uh, symmetry is acting locally uh, in the space of those uh, local operator. And in order for this statement that, this, uh, that there is global symmetry G, uh, in this quantum field theory makes sense. Uh, it should be that uh, it should be fa uh, this uh, uh, unitary homomorphism faithfully represent this uh, uh, group. And uh, well, actually, I shouldn't have said represent because I'm, not, I'm saying that this is not a representation. But what we, I mean that for every element of G, uh, there is at least one element of this algebra on which uh, this acts non-trivially in this way. And of course, uh, this symmetry should be conserved, so it means that it should it should commute with energy momentum tensor. Namely, it is one of those topological defects. OK, and uh, one of the very important property of this symmetry that I'd like to focus on is this splitability property. So let me uh, spend a couple of uh, slides on this subject. Uh, suppose uh, the group is continuous, uh, compact Lie group, for example, and suppose there is a Neta current. So in that case, the symmetry generator that I, I defined over here can be expressed as the exponential of integral of uh, uh, Neta charge. 
So, so in this case, uh, the situation is very simple because this, since this is an exponential integral of some well-defined observable, so you can define this not only on Cauchy surface, but any subspace of the Cauchy surface. Just, you just need to restrict this integration region to this subspace. So in that case, if you restrict this uh, 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 integral to this subregion, then if uh, it still acts in the same way for the algebra of local operator, localized operator in this region, just like in this way. But uh, if you take operator from the complement of this region, then it should commute. So we can construct uh, such operator in, in a case like that. Or I can also write it in this way, that if you consider uh, uh, this uh, operator defined on the union of this joint region, then you can write it as a product of operators defined on each of these regions. Okay? So this is obvious from this, uh, in this way of writing it. But it turns out that this property holds for more general class of uh, symmetry which do not necessarily have neta current. So for example, it even uh, applies to discrete symmetry. And so this was uh, shown by uh, algebra, uh, people working on algebraic quantum field theory, uh, assuming that quantum field theory has so-called split property. And now this split property is actually going to be very important for us and also as you can uh, we'll see, is quite relevant for uh, when discussing holography and entanglement in general. So let me expand on this a little bit. So, so these people are actually some uh, algebraic quantum field theory people define the split property as follows. So suppose you have quantum field theory as, as, as before on time and uh, some Cauchy surface. We say that this quantum field theory has split property if the following is true for any open region, S and S prime, so that uh, the closure of S is included in the interior of S prime. So you have this kind of nested configuration. So you have S and you have S prime. And then on S, you can define uh, algebra of localized operator in S, and you can define algebra of localized operator on S prime. We say that this quantum field theory has split property when there is a type one factor in between these algebras. Okay, so then I have to define what I mean by type one factor. So this is a, a terminology for Neumann algebra. So suppose you have a Hilbert space and suppose you have a, space, a set of linear operator on it. We say that this uh, subalgebra is a factor if the center of this algebra is trivial. So by that I mean that uh, the center only contains product, uh, the, uh, uh, something proportional to identity. And it is called type one uh, if it contains a minimal projection. Now this is a property that is uh, always true when the, uh, the space is, uh, Hilbert space is finite dimensional, in which case you can consider projection to uh, one dimensional space. And, but this is a sort of a generalization of this notion that works in, in the dimensional case, uh, which is not always true. And uh, so when it is satisfied, it's called type one. A nice thing about type one factor is that, well, actually it's realized on Hilbert space as a space of linear, uh, 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 a set of linear operator on the Hilbert space. And moreover, the original Hilbert space essentially split in this way. So we say that when we have, a, uh, we can say that when you have a type one factor, Hilbert space has this tensor product form. And then this type one factor can be realized as a, a set of linear operator on the first part of the Hilbert space. And the commutant of this type one factor is a space of a set of linear operator acting on the second part. So what the split, splitability is saying is that uh, well, even though uh, uh, A of S itself is not type one factor, but if you thicken this region a little bit, then you can find uh, algebra which can be realized in this way. So, uh, and the, uh, uh, it is generally expected uh, that uh, uh, a quantum field theory in flat Euclidean space uh, has this type of property. But if you consider more uh, a general topology, yeah, this is not necessarily true. So, so just, to, just to demonstrate what we, why this, this kind of property is important, uh, let me discuss uh, one example. So this is an example of a pure Maxwell theory 
in D dimension, where the spatial Cauchy slice has S1 factor, circle factor, times some compact space. So in this case, so, so this is pure Maxwell theory, so there is no charged particle. So in this case, uh, the integral of electric flux on this compact side uh, is conserved. And in fact, since there are no charged operators, so if you choose this region S in this way, not wrapping in this S1 direction, then there are, since there are no charged operators, this operator commutes with uh, all the localized operator here. So that means that this electric flux must be in center uh, of this algebra. So that, however, this operator is non-trivial because you can consider Wilson line wrapping around this S1 direction, which has non-trivial commutation relation with this operator. So you have a non-trivial operator uh, uh, which uh, 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 is in the center. So that means that uh, uh, in this case, uh, there is no type 1 factor in this case. And uh, so in this case, indeed, the Hilbert space does not split. And uh, uh, you can see that this trouble is caused because there is a one-form symmetry which is exactly generated by this. So this, somehow the problem of non-splitability is tied to the fact that there is non-trivial uh, 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 one-form symmetry. Uh, so here I assume that the theory is a pure Maxwell theory, but this can be cured also uh, if you can add the charged particle. For example, if you have uh, a gauge, if the gauge group is compact U1, then, you can, then you, there is a, a minimally charged particle. If, if you can add minimally charged particle, you can break this Wilson line. So then there is no problem that, uh, 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 with this type of construction. And uh, this is related to the fact that uh, if you consider a uh, 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 product of this kind of Maxwell theory, then you can, Im you can imagine that there is a global symmetry which rotates the two gauge group. But you can show that there is actually no neta charge associated to it. And this is consistent with uh, uh, this type of theorem, because if there were not, no neta charge, then the corresponding symmetry should be splitable. But this requires the split property of quantum field theory, which this does not have. Okay. So, but anyway, for our purpose, uh, this example is, is the red herring because this is non-trivial topology. And we are mostly interested in the case when the topology of the Cauchy surface uh, is simpler. <coughs> so let me just recap. So suppose you have quantum field theory uh, on some uh, Cauchy surface. We say that it's split uh, if and only if uh, there is a type 1 factor between these two uh, 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 algebra of uh, localized operators. And nice thing about it is that with respect to this, the Hilbert space split. And uh, uh, so if you have a Euclidean space, the, uh, the corresponding quantum field theory, the quantum field theory on it is generally expected to be uh, to, to split. And uh, so this means that if you consider a conformal field theory, even the theory on sphere should also split because uh, there is a correspondence between uh, state uh, and operators uh, in this case. And uh, the splitability in these cases is actually uh, sufficient uh, uh, for our purpose. So this is uh, what I wanted to say about uh, global symmetry in quantum field theory. So now let me move on uh, to uh, global symmetry uh, in quantum gravity in ADS. So as I said, uh, this is so. This is the concept that I'm going to show in the next section. That in the ne next section I'm going to show that there is no such thing as global symmetry uh, in quantum gravity in ADS. So of course uh, we can accomplish this task if we demand too much thing, too many uh, features to the global symmetry. If we put lots of uh, condition on it, then you can make them easily inconsistent with each other and you can prove yourself. So, so the, the, our task is to try to come up with a set of conditions that we think are absolutely needed for the global symmetry to have uh, in this context. And they still see that even with this minimum assumption, it still leads to inconsistency. So that's what we want to do. Okay, so unfortunately, in view of the time, I, I do not have t uh, sort of, I, I am not able to go uh, explain how, what is a minimum set of condition that we came up with and then uh, how we uh, understand the consequence of that. 
But uh, what, so here is what main thing I wanted to say. So we require a couple of property. One property is that we wanted to define the global symmetry in the bulk in such a way that it's sort of uh, continuously go to the global symmetry in the ordinary quantum field theory in the limit when you turn off the Newton constant. And in fact, we'll be considering mostly a weakly coupled bulk dual. So, so in that case, uh, this kind of feature should be important. And the other is that, uh, uh, so, uh, so in, in this uh, uh, weakly coupled uh, gravity description in the bulk, in the low energy effective theory, uh, there are a quasi-local operator with uh, 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 gravitational dressing and the gauge dressing attached to it. And symmetry should be realized uh, uh, on this uh, set of local, quasi-local operators. So we require uh, those features for the global symmetry uh, in the bulk. So if you, uh, if you uh, uh, assume this condition, then we can see the following things. So suppose you have uh, uh, Quasi local operator in the bulk, and it can be a black hole with a finite size, for example, but some uh, a local excitation occupying in some finite region of the bulk. Then you can consider uh, by using asymptotic conformal symmetry, you can consider moving it towards some boundary point, and then you can define a local operator in the boundary conformal field theory. Conversely, uh, if you have a uh, local operator in conformal field theory, on the boundary conformal field theory, uh, you can use a, a bulk, uh, the op state operator correspondence to construct, consider the corresponding state in conformal field theory, which in the bulk perspective would correspond to some local excitation in the bulk. And indeed, uh, if you again apply this procedure to move this local excitation back to the boundary, you would reproduce the corresponding, you would get back to the original local operator in conformal field theory. So that, this is, well, of course, I'm just repeating what uh, most of the people know, which is that there is a correspondence between local operator in conformal field theory and the quasi uh, local excitation in the bulk. So, so we, have sort of listed, we have listed the property of global symmetry along this line of requirement. And then we found that if you assume this, it follows that, uh, in fact, all these property requires that in fact, if you have global symmetry in ADS, it automatically implies that there is a corresponding global symmetry in conformal field theory. Okay? So we are not demanding that uh, 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 global symmetry to be conformal field theory of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, global symmetry in the gravitational system to be global symmetry of the conformal field, se conformal field theory dual, but with this requirement, uh, uh, this follows. If this is just a def uh, condition, then there is no con inconsistency because conformal field theory can have global symmetry. But it turns out that uh, there are other conditions that uh, uh, global symmetry in quantum field theory should have. So, so this is not a set of uh, 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 conditions that we used in our definition of global symmetry, but this is what the, uh, came out from it, which is one of the conditions is that uh, by requiring these, uh, we found that uh, global symmetry in quantum gravity is a global symmetry in its dual CFT, but there are some additional conditions, such as that it should act locally within the uh, quasi-local bulk operator, the mapping quasi-local operator into quasi-local operator, and during that process, it should preserve the gravitational dressing. It should not act on the gravitational dressing because the gravitational dressing is something that is neutral. Uh, we assume to be neutral under global symmetry, and in order, just like in the case of uh, uh, symmetry of quantum field theory, in order for this symmetry to make sense, it should act faithfully on the space of quasi-local operators. And we require these operators to be gauge invariant so that you can have a smooth limit when you turn off the uh, smooth limit going to the quantum field theory when you turn off the Newton coupling. And we also require that uh, this type of global symmetry act distinctly from asymptotic conformal field theory on the boundary, because there are cases where uh, seemingly uh, this uh, global symmetry is actually mixed up with some uh, space-time symmetry. For example, if you consider fermion parity, it is actually a two pi rotation of the space, and these, these act in the same way. So we wanted to separate that, so we added this, uh, we added this additional requirement. So, so these are the conditions we require for a global symmetry for uh, quantum gravity in ADS. And then 
we are going to show that with these conditions, there are no such thing. There are no such things that satisfy these conditions. <coughs> so, so here is an argument. So, so you know that uh, in, for our argument, we use uh, what's called the entanglement wedge risk construction or subregion subregion duality uh, of uh, ADS CFT correspondence. And uh, so basically, what this means is that uh, if we want to have uh, uh, local excitation which is uh, happening deep in the uh, ADS bulk, then we need to employ entanglement property of vacuum over a very large region of the conformal field theory. So, so here is a, here is a one page argument of why uh, a global symmetry cannot exist uh, in the ADS gravity. So suppose to the contrary, that uh, gravitational theory in ADS has global symmetry. So then by assumption, there must be a quasi-local bulk operator that transforms faithfully under the symmetry we are considering. But we show that uh, that symmetry should also be interpreted as global symmetry of the dual conformal history. So that means that there must be a symmetry generator on the boundary conformal history, which has a split property. So that means that the symmetry generator, the, this, this uh, symmetry transformation should be generated by unitary operator of the boundary conformal field theory, which has a split property. That is that if you divide a boundary into this kind of segment, it becomes product of these operators. The, the important point is that these are acting individually on these segments. So on each of these segments, here is an entanglement wedge. So if you choose the location of quasi local operator deep inside of ADS, then none of these operators would have non-trivial commutation with local excitation here. So that would be a contradiction with the assumption that this should faithfully re realize this symmetry. So this is the sort of main part of our argument. Thank you. So I'd like to make a few comments about uh, uh, this argument. First, uh, so this is actually maybe uh, something that may be familiar, may be familiar to uh, people in uh, quantum information. So suppose uh, uh, you, con you consider a product of a physical qubit uh, and then uh, define a code subspace, which is a subspace or product of this uh, physical qubit to define some logical qubit like that. Then uh, it is uh, uh, easy to see that uh, a uh, non-trivial unitary operator on the side of a logical qubit cannot be realized as product of unitary operator acting on the individual physical qubit if each one of these uh, preserves the code subspace. So this is something. So basically, the, that uh, this log, uh, logical qubit is constructed. The, uh, the code subspace for the logical qubit employs the entanglement uh, between among these physical uh, qubits. So if you have a unitary operator acting in each one of them, then it won't do anything. But you can see that uh, this idea is essentially what is happening here. That uh, this, you can think of each one of these as physical qubit. And then local excitation in the bulk correspond to logical qubit, because uh, local excitation in the bulk is supposed to be uh, characterized by different elements in the code sub subspace. And uh, so the, the fact that, uh, uh, that this, this con uh, unitary operator acts trivially on this operator corresponds to the fact that uh, non-trivial unitary operator acting over here cannot be realized by operator with product structure like that. So that's one comment. And then I have a few uh, 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 other comments. One is that uh, uh, although I don't, I don't have time to describe this, uh, this formalism can be extended to the case of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, so so when, uh, uh, this argument also works when the uh, global symmetry is spontaneously broken. So we would say that uh, there is no such thing as spontaneously broken global symmetry in the bulk uh, gravitational theory either. So this in particular means that suppose, for example, you have a scalar low energy effective field theory containing massless scalar field with shift symmetry like that, then this shift symmetry must be broken at some point. So this is required by this theorem. This argument also works not only for discrete symmetry, but also discrete spacetime symmetry 
such as parity or time translational, uh, sorry, time reflection symmetry. So this in particular means that uh, when you consider uh, 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 quantum gravity, you have to sum over non-orientable manifold because parity symmetry needs to be gauged. This argument, of course, rely on holography and uh, uh, non-trivial entanglement structure on the boundary. So in particular, this does not work for 2D gravity, which does not have uh, the holographic description. So for example, there are many examples of 2D gravity, like those on the string worksheet, which can have global symmetry. So for example, E8 cross E8 heterotic string worksheet has E8 cross E8 global symmetry, and there is nothing wrong with this. Uh, type, the string worksheet can have type one property or type pro two property. Namely, you have a choice of summing or not summing over non-orientable two-dimensional worksheet surfaces. And uh, so that's also counter to this claim, uh, contrary to this claim. And then there is a, uh, also a, a discussion of whether pure Einstein gravity exists or not. And uh, one of the puzzle has been that uh, uh, there seems to be no reasonable uh, a dual conformal field theory, but it could be that pure Einstein gravity has no uh, CFD dual, in which case uh, it is possible to consider orientable pure Einstein gravity in three dimension also. Yes? Beg pardon? Yes, I did assume that when we define global symmetry, uh, we assume that the uh, symmetry commute with dre gravitational dressing. Yes. Yeah, otherwise, we could detect the gravitational yeah. dressing in the region. So it right. So it's important as, uh, that uh, uh, we, as uh, we assume that we are only so except for this thing, we are considering a, a, gra a, a global symmetry which are not acting on space time and therefore commute with gravitational dressing. Yes. Higher or do you mean that you have to, so when, when you have to sort of uh, iteratively refine your gravitational dressing? Yeah, I couldn't, we couldn't think of a situation where uh, uh, anything like that happens. Uh, do you have an indication of how big the violation of the symmetry is? I mean, there are yeah, so this is, this is, uh, this is, I'm going to, this is one of those to-do list things that I, I'm going to uh, come to at the very end. But thank you for raising this. Okay, so, so this is exactly the kind of figure that, uh, that maybe uh, I, sh I, I should have raised. So, so you can have, of course, a gauge symmetry, and gauge symmetry is consistent with holography. And the reason is that if you have a, a charged particle with respect to gauge symmetry, then you have to have a, a gauge dressing and uh, that can be detected by one of these. But so, so in that case, we would say that uh, uh, gauge, if you have a, a gauge symmetry in the gravitational system with gauge group G, there is a corresponding global symmetry in conformal field theory with the same gauge group G. But is that true? In order to show that it is true, we need to check that, uh, uh, that every element of the uh, 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 G in the conformal field theory acts non-trivially on the, uh, the bulk degrees of freedom. And uh, so we can show that. So namely, what we need to show is that uh, this, if you have a, suppose you have a conformal field theory with global symmetry G, then there is this unitary operator that is uh, 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 realizing this symmetry. And the question is that can you, for every element of G, can you find bulk operator that is transforming non-trivially? And if you can show them, then, then, then you have the same G. And indeed, it is a true, and this is a Wilson line uh, uh, operator uh, going through the ADS wormhole. So this is the idea that was actually used uh, in uh, Daniel's earlier paper in the case of U1 gauge group and uh, this uh, 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 sort of straightforwardly uh, generalized to the non-Abelian case that I'm going to describe. So the idea is that this Wilson line operator penetrating through the ADS wormhole geometry has two ends attached one side of conformal field theory and the other side of the conformal field theory on, on, uh, on uh, both, road, both sides of ADS wormhole. So 
Uh, and then it's acting with a representation, uh, it, it, it carries a representation index alpha on each of these. So that means that suppose, for example, you have a Wilson line operator in the bulk uh, penetrating through the ADS wormhole. And if you act the left group action, uh, left action on this conformal field theory on the left side, it gives you this representation. But there is a standard theorem of representation theory of group that says that for every element of the group, you can find some representation for which this representation matrix is non-trivial. So that means that uh, uh, there is no uh, 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 element of G that acts trivially on bulk operators. So, so this shows that, uh, uh, that we should have the same G for bulk and the boundary. But if you have, uh, if you can have, uh, uh, if, you, if the, uh, this symmetry is faithfully re uh, uh, realized uh, uh, among the bulk operator, then, uh, in fact, if the symmetry group is compact, you can show that uh, this can be reduced to finite dimensional faithful representation. And if you have that, you can use that to generate all other uh, finite dimensional irreducible representation of the group. So this actually proved what is known as completeness hypothesis of uh, uh, a group representation. So the hypothesis is that if the quantum gravity has gauge symmetry G, then, then uh, all uh, uh, possible finite dimensional irreducible representation of the group should be realized in the Hilbert, physical Hilbert space of the quantum gravity. And uh, uh, this is not always true in generic quantum field theory but this is believed to be true uh, in gravitational theory. And uh, in this case, we were actually, by, by proving that it's the same G, uh, we were able to prove that, uh, in fact, uh, this completeness hypothesis hold uh, in, in this uh, uh, gravitational system in ADS. So that's all uh, I wanted to tell you, and I'm the only one between you and the wonderful banquet, so I should try to wrap up. So, so I would like to uh, mention a few things that uh, uh, I, I, th I think that uh, it would be, uh, we, we think would be nice to do. And uh, one of the things I want to tell you is that uh, a couple of months ago, I became the director of uh, Calvary IPMU at the University of Tokyo uh, in joint appointment with Caltech for the next five years. And there are many nice projects we want to do. And one of the, uh, one of the things we want to do is to build uh, what we call a uh, uh, hyper kamiokande, which is 10 times bigger than the current super kamiokande. And what it can do is it can, of course, measure neutrino uh, parameters like mass and CP variation precisely. But it also extends the range of uh, uh, neutrino astronomy. So now we, can, we, we should be able to see a, super no, a neutrino from a supernova like 6 million light years ago. Eh? And uh, in terms of volume, it's like 50,000. Uh, times uh, the previous super kamiokande, which detected the uh, neutrino from a great Magellan uh, crowd. So we hope that uh, we should be able to see a neutrino from supernova more regularly. But in the context of my talk today, uh, it also should be enabled to cover almost all the landscape of uh, uh, ground unification models based on SU5 and SO10, based on measuring the proton decay ratio. So, so when I was a grad student, uh, super, uh, the Kamiokande killed off minimum SU5 uh, GATT model. And that was when I was a grad student. But now, uh, uh, Hyper-K would cover almost uh, all of this region. So that leads us to, for us, for us theorists, the following question. So can we tell experimenters that this is really enough to, to detect uh, proton decay. So this leads to uh, Juan's question. So, so, <laughs> so, so any global symmetry in low energy effective theory in quantum gravity must be approximate. That's what uh, uh, we showed. So the important question is how is it broken? And can we, show, can we tell how, how big the effect is? And, and right now, we don't even have a convincing uh, argument show that it's it, it, it violated by term suppressed by inverse power of Planck mass. And even showing that would be fantastic, I think, uh, thing to do because, I mean, we don't know. It could be exponentially suppressed by Planck mass, for example. So, so, so it'd be nice to actually uh, address these questions and maybe ADS-CFT correspondence argument that I presented here can be refined to, to address uh, these questions. 
And the other question that is also, so basically it's all these questions are related to quantifying what we just showed. Uh, the other question is that we said that there must be, uh, the, the completeness hypothesis says that uh, all possibly reducible representation should appear in the physical Hilbert space of uh, quantum gravity theory. But it doesn't tell us wh where it appears, what the mass of the corresponding particle. And so it would be, it'd be nice to be able to so give upper bound on the mass of a charged particle required by the completeness hypothesis. And uh, of course, I mean, it would be nice to go beyond the ADHCFT correspondence and generalize to this to other geometry. So that's all I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>